Hey guys, it's Lotus, and welcome back to another video. Today, we're going to continue on with our read-along of Urha. Let's jump right in. Chapter 154. Shijun, I'm going to go look for Ye Wang Shi. Well, now it was awkward. Everyone else in the room, from Madame Wang to Xue Meng and Xue Jian Yong, had politely stood up in greeting when Nan Gong Liu entered earlier. Chu Anning hadn't cared to do so and had remained standing where he was by the window. But as for Moran, Ru Feng's sect was nothing more to him than some worthless garbage sect he had trodden underfoot in his previous life. He knew well that the place was a disjointed mess beneath all that glamour, hardly worthy of any respect. But he really didn't mean to make things difficult for Nan Gong Liu just now. He was just so used to it that it didn't even occur to him to stand. It was quite the strange scene indeed. Nan Gong Liu, the host and the elder, standing there with an amicable smile, not at all angry, expression full of warm familiarity still. Moran, the guest, and the junior, reclining languidly in the Tai Chi chair with his legs crossed and a piping hot cup of tea in his hand. Xue Jian Yong hadn't been paying attention to what Moran had been doing earlier, but turning around to look now, he couldn't help feeling mortified. This Moran really had no manners! And you must be... The famed Mo Jungshu that everyone's been talking about these last few years. Putting the lid back on his cup of tea, Moran lifted his eyes and replied, That's me. Such gallant yu. Moran cut him off with a smile. <laughs> Nan Gong Xianjun, you've already used gallant youth on my cousin, so mayhaps not on me as well? He spoke courteously with an easy tone and a warm smile, but the words themselves were anything but courteous. Nor did he bother to stand. In fact, after tossing out those words, he lifted his teacup once again, scraped the celadon lid against the rim of the cup, and blew at the gently rising steam. And then, dropping his gaze along with those dense long eyelashes, went back to leisurely sipping his tea. He was young, handsome, tall, and poised. His attitude and mannerisms made it seem like he was the real master of Rufang sect, the one who stood at the top of the entire cultivation realm, with Nan Gong Liu was just a dog perched by his seat. Haha, <laughs> Mo Jungshu is quite right. I just couldn't think of a better phrase due to my own lack of learning, so... That can't be right. Moran put his teacup down and looked up with a smile. Nan Gong Xianjun has had no end of praises to give out ever since entering this room. So if you aren't a smooth talker, then who out there is? Ayah, Mo Jungshu flatters me too much. Who said I was flattering you? Moran said with a smile, bright eyes fixed on him. Being a smooth talker isn't always a good thing. Xue Jin Yong finally couldn't take it anymore. Lowering his voice, he muttered, Runner! From his point of view, it was understandable for Chu Anning to be unfriendly toward Nan Gong Liu. At least there was history between them, and Chu Anning had the social status for it. But Moran... But Moran paid Xue Jin Yong no mind, speaking instead to Nan Gong Liu. Nan Gong Xianjun should save the honeyed words for the other juniors. I'm a crude person. I won't understand it, nor do I want to hear it. Xue Jian Yang, dot dot dot. Moran was well aware that his uncle would be displeased with his behavior, but he didn't regret it in the least. There were far too many disgusting things in the world. Chu Wanning had a fierce temper and was always sticking his neck out, like back then with the exorcism at Lo Xian Chen's place, when Chu Wanning had beaten up Landlord Chen, the paying client, regardless of any repercussions to his reputation, because the Chens had mistreated a helpless girl. Chu Wanning had done nothing wrong, yet he was always being bad-mouthed by others. People would call him cold-blooded, out of control, and unfeeling. He didn't want to let other people call his shijun ill-mannered ever again. And so, he would act even more egre egregious than Chu Anning, even more over the top. Dumb though it was, it was the only way he knew of to shelter Chu Anning behind himself. Thus, the other three in this room accepted Nan Gong Liu's flattery and favor out of politeness and decorum, but Moran did not. It wasn't a spur-of-the-moment thing. Ever since he found out that it had been Chu Anning who had carried him home on his back from that mountain of corpses, crawling when he had to, ever since he'd seen, in Mengpo Hall, that human soul and that bowl of wontons, ever since he'd gone to the depths of the underworld to bring back Chu Anning, he vowed that he would stand with Chu Anning from now on, for as long as Chu Anning would have him. Nan Gong Liu had already run into two walls in a row, were it the head of any other sect, they would have long since flown into a table-flipping rage and kicked all of them out. But Nan Gong Liu didn't do any of that. He acted like nothing whatsoever had happened, cheerfully chatting with Xue Jian Yang for a while longer, 
until Shui Zheng Yong couldn't take the embarrassment anymore and pulled him aside to quietly apologize that he had been too lax with his nephew. Only for Nan Gong Liu to laugh it off. Ayya, it's perfectly normal for a youngster to be bold. I actually think it's a great thing that Mo Jungshu is so passionate. After the meeting with Nan Gong Liu, Ru Feng disciples led the group to the courtyard where they will be staying. Moran sneezed the whole way there. Shui Long turned to look at him. Maybe the Nan Gong sect leader put a curse on you for all that smart mouthing just now. Shut it, more like you got cursed. Moran's eyes were all teary. I, achoo! I can't stand such a strong incense smell. That room back there, achoo! The incense is really too, achoo! Too, too unpleasant. Ah, sh achoo! Shijun! Chi Wanning furrowed his brows and handed his handkerchief over with a disdainful, how unsightly, wipe yourself up. Terry eyed still, Moran accepted the high tongue, uh, high tongue embroidered handkerchief with a grin. Shujun is so nice to me. Thank you, Shujun. Chi Wan Ning was a little flustered. Uh, who's nice to you? That's right! Shui Meng piped up, unwilling to be second. Who's nice to you? I'm clearly the one that Shujun is nicest to. Moran retorted tauntingly. Aren't you a little too old to be making a contest of that? Before turning all serious and holding up the handkerchief in his hand. See this? Shujun said he'll sew me one just like this. Do you have one? Dot dot dot. Chi Wanning snatched the handkerchief back with lightning speed, snapping, Mo Wei Yu. Shui Meng was frozen in shock for a second before flying into a rage. Yeah, right. As if anyone's gonna believe that Shujun was sew you a handkerchief. Keep dreaming. <sighs> Shameless. While chatting, they arrived at the courtyard that Nan Gong Liu had prepared for them. The courtyard had four sections, one for Shui Zheng Yong and Madame Wang, and one for each of the rest of them. Flowers danced gently between winding paths to quiet retreats, and the soothing sound of running water babbled serenely in the background, truly a scene of singular elegance. Moran, who had been in good spirits, faltered when he saw that it was this courtyard they would be staying in, his eyes glazing over for a moment despite himself. Following everyone else into the courtyard, his mood only sank ever lower as he took in the details of the surroundings. This was the one place in Ru Feng's sect that had left a deep impression on him in the previous lifetime. To now come across this place once more, he couldn't help thinking about how, if Chiu Ning hadn't called him back at the cost of his own life in this lifetime, perhaps he would have walked the same path as before and become Tasha, Emperor Tasha in June and it would have been around this time that he'd be leading millions of Genlao chess pieces and burning this renowned sect to the ground. The thought sent cold sweat streaming down his back and a thousand thoughts rushing through his mind. Moran closed his eyes. He could keep his emotions in check now, was no longer the youth who wore his heart on his sleeve that he'd used to be, so no one noticed the haze clouding his heart. They each retired to their own rooms to rest. Moran stood in front of his unit for a while, hands folded behind his back, but did not go inside. Feeling a little uneasy, one of the maids in the courtyard asked carefully, Does Xian Jun find the room unsatisfactory? Oh, no, no! Breaking out of his daze, Moran smiled. The courtyard just reminded me of somewhere I used to live, is all. What a coincidence. I was worried that Xian Jun didn't like the place. If Xian Jun needs anything, please feel free to let me know and I will do my best to fulfill it. Moran said with a smile, I'm good, thank you. He looked up at the hundred-year-old osmanthus tree in the yard, its trunk so thick he would strain to wrap his arms around it, dancing shade of its foliage sweeping across his eyes like ghosts from his past. Eyelashes quivering minutely, a melancholic feeling filled his chest. He turned abruptly and called out to the maid who was just leaving. Oh, wait! What does Shenzhen need? I wanted to ask about someone. Moran paused, and when he lifted his eyes, his gaze was torch bright. Do you know of a... A... Actually, never mind. Let me ask about someone else instead, Morant said. Do you know where Ye Wang Shi is? The maid answered, Ye Gongzi is Elder Shu's personal disciple and lives with him in the same courtyard. Xian Jun can find him there. Hearing that, Morant secretly let out the breath he'd been holding. The last time he'd seen Ye Wang Shi had been at that restaurant where he'd begged Nan Gongzi to go back with him and Nan Gongzi had refused. And Ye Wang Shi had said, if it's because of me that you don't want to go back to Rufang sect, I'll leave. To be honest, he was a little worried about Ye Wang Shi. Ye Wang Shi had already suffered enough in the previous lifetime, and he felt like Ye Wang Shi was actually quite similar to Chu Wan Ning. Both of them people of morals and conviction, just that one was more reserved while the other was more fiery, but neither had a good ending. 
Repentant over what he'd done in the past, Moran hoped that the Ye Wang Shi could be better off in this lifetime. He couldn't help being relieved that Nan Gongsi hadn't been so heartless as to really chase Ye Wang Shi off. Elder Shu's courtyard was called Farewell to Three Lifetimes. The name supposedly taken from the verse, one sip of Meng Po's soup to bid farewell to three lifetimes' memories, to express the fleetingness of life. It would be best to forget that which should be forgotten rather than dwelling on them incessantly, since all would be forgotten in death by the time one goes to Naihei Bridge anyway. Sure sounded like a pessimistic guy. No wonder Ye Wang Shi had turned out so repressed that you wouldn't even be able to beat a fart out of him. What a clever parrot! How interesting! Now recite this! One bowl of rice, one scoop of water, in a, humbly, in a humble alley. The guard had already gone to pass on word of his visit and what he was here for, and Moran had yet to step across the per and Moran had yet to step around the partition wall when he heard the languid, teasing voice of a man drift out from within the courtyard. Moran took a couple more steps inside before he saw the man standing in the sun-bathed courtyard. He looked to be in his early 30s and was dressed in a robe so plain that it even had a few patches in the corners of its sleeves. He also wasn't wearing any shoes despite how cold it was, standing barefooted on the ice-cold stone pavement with a handful of sunflower seeds, teasing a snow-white parrot with blue eyes and a long tail. The parrot flapped its wings as it rocked side to side on its perch, seemingly quite pleased with itself as it sang loudly out, Ah, one bowl of soup, one scoop of water, in an humble alley. Mmm, not bad, not bad. You're smarter than Shao Yezi, you know. He wasn't nearly this clever when he was young. Couldn't memorize this bit at all, no matter what he did. The man fed the parrot some seeds. Here, treats from daddy. Dot, dot, dot. Calling himself a bird's daddy? Did that make him a cuckoo then? When the man turned and saw Moran standing by the partition wall, he first cracked the sunflower seed between his teeth and spit out the shell, before suddenly beaming a bright smile with a hint of something darker beneath. Under the radiant sunlight, he gave off an, he gave off an air of breezy nonchalance. Mo Junshu, Moran, yes? He smiled. Pleased to meet you. Moran smiled. Re Moran returned the smile and replied, Same here. After the exchange of pleasantries, Moran took a closer look at the other person's face. He looked vaguely familiar, as if he'd seen him before during his slaughter of Rufeng sect in the past life. Was he... Yifu, you're running around without shoes again. A familiar voice suddenly rang out. Such an important, such an unimportant remark, but one that was thunderous to Moran's ears. Moran whipped his head around just in time to see Ye Wang Shi come in through the moon gate, tall and slender as ever, gentleness in his expression. He walked over to the man, holding a pair of yellow satin shoes which he set down in front of him. Yifu? Ye Wang Shi's Yifu? Through the thrumming of blood in his ears, he could practically hear the cries and screams from a lifetime past, the clang of sword against sword, the maelstrom of battle drums. Yi Fu! A face marred with bloodstains burst forth through his memories. It was Ye Wang Shi, crying and screaming, voice splitting the heavens themselves. When he'd raised Rufang sect back then, Nan Gong Liu had fled to save his own hide, leaving the 72 cities headless and floundering. Later, Wu Feng Sect's foremost guardian elder Shu had stepped up and taken the reins, marshalling the panicked masses in resistance together with Ye Wang Shi, masses that Moran would have otherwise wiped out in an instant. He wasn't even a Nan Gong, yet he took on the responsibility that should have belonged to a sect leader with that surname, using his position as elder Wu Feng Sect to defend its 72 cities to the end. He wasn't even Ye Wang Shi's father by blood. Yet he'd moved to block the sharp blade filled with spiritual power piercing through, piercing toward Ye Wang Shi's back, using his own body to protect the child he had raised. Moran had been watching from atop the city walls then. Seeing this scene, the corner of his lips had twisted into a sneer. Heavens only knew how jealous he'd been in that moment. To think that there was someone out there who would willingly die for another with no blood relation. His narrow-minded self had felt shocked, pained, and he was so jealous he'd almost gone mad, so jealous that even his eyes had gone, had gone bloodshot. He thought, great, that's just great. Look how lucky Ye Wang Shi was. As for himself, if there had been even just a single person in this whole wide world other than his mother who'd be willing to die for him, would he have ended up like this? The heavens were kind to everyone else. Only to him were they so grudging, so cruel. He'd wanted to destroy everyone that he was jealous of. All these people huddled together for warmth. 
he was going to send every last one of them to hell. How was it any fair that only he never got even a single day of contentment or a single moment of warmth? That the only person who had ever been kind to him had died so long ago? It was the only bit of warmth he'd ever had. Why did it have to be taken away from him? He hated. Dot dot dot. Looking back now, Moran only thought what Moran's only thought was how stupid he had been back then. There was someone in this world who would willingly die for him, but he was the one who had missed it, had let that person down, had not realized. Moran closed his eyes and took a moment to calm his turbulent emotions before opening them up again. Before opening them again to look up. He knew who this man was now. He was Ye Wang Shi Shijun, as well as his Yifu. Shu Shuang Lin. The person who, on the second day of the slaughter of Rufeng sect, had died in battle to save Ye Wang Shi. Moran turned away, a bitter aching in his heart. He couldn't bear to look at that smiling, carefree person bathed in sunlight any longer. He wanted to say hi to Ye Wang Shi instead. Ye Gong Zi. Ye Wang Shi paused, only just noticing Moran standing a little ways off. Then he smiled and said, Ah, Mo Xiong is here too. Long time no see. Long time no see. The Ye Wang Shi of this lifetime had only met Moran a handful of times and wasn't very familiar with him, so he continued to smile politely while asking, Are you here looking for my Yifu? Dot dot dot. Moran glanced over at Shu Shuang Lin before shaking his head, feeling a little awkward. No, I'm here for you. Well, well look at that, Shao Ye Zi. When was the last time someone came here looking for you? Smiling lazily, Shu Shuang Lin popped another sunflower seed into his mouth. Where did you meet Mo Zhongshi anyway? At the Peach Blossom Springs. Huh, that's nice, that's nice. Shu Shuang Lin said with a smile while putting the rest of the sunflower seeds into the bird's food bowl. You youngins keep chatting. I'm going to go take a walk around. Ye Wang Shi tugged at him. Yi Fu, you aren't wearing your shoes again. Oh, I forgot. Smiling, Shu Shuang Lin put the shoes on. There, better? But out of the corner of his eye, Moran saw the man stroll leisurely around the corner, bend down, take the shoes off again, and tuck them into the front of his robe before leisurely continuing on his merry way. Dot dot dot. This father-son pair, in terms of both appearance and personality, really were strange. Shu Shuang Lin looked very young due to his cultivation method, aging not a day past 30, and seemed more like Ye Wang Shi's brother than anything else. And then, taking into account his willful, mischievous temperament, he didn't even seem like the older brother, but the younger instead. So what was with that plaque outside solemnly inscribed farewell to three lifetimes then? Was he just messing around or what? Side by side, Ye Wang Shi and Moran walked slowly along a shaded path. The courtyard was full of both flowering trees and fruit trees, but it was the middle of winter, so everything was withered, leaving only a couple of dry yellow leaves dangling from the branches, quivering in the wake of the passing wind. Sorry about the last time at the restaurant, it was quite embarrassing. Uh, not at all, Moran said. How have you been lately? He regretted it as soon as he said it, because Ye Wang Shi was the kind of person who wouldn't say anything even if he was miserable. Sure enough, Ye Wang Shi smiled a little and said, I'm alright, and you? Pretty good. The two of them weren't close. Moran only came looking for him because he remembered the wrongs he had done in the past life, felt remorseful, and wanted to come see how this still living Ye Wang Shi was doing. But now that he was alone with him, he didn't really know what to say. Moran knew many of Ye Wang Shi's secrets, none of which he could bring up, so he found himself with nothing to talk about. The two of them strolled in silence for a while. Then Ye Wang Shi asked, How's Sha Suni been? Moran was caught by surprise for a moment, then he chuckled. <laughs> you still remember that name? Impressive. His name is rather memorable. Haha, <laughs> I suppose. Sha Sun is here too. You can see him later. Ye Wang Shi seemed surprised. He's here too? But I don't think the sect leader would have invited. <laughs> you still don't know who Sha Sun really is, do you? Moran said with a smile. Let me tell you, then. It's a long story, though. And so he recounted the chain of events that led to Chiwaning becoming Sha Sun Ye Wang Shi looked pensive for a while afterwards, then said with a sigh, Mo Zhongshu is very fortunate to have him as your master. To which Moran said, And Ru Feng sect is very fortunate to count Ye Gongzi among its disciples. Ye Wang Shi, a little embarrassed, replied with a small smile, Mo Gongzi is too kind. They arrived at a small red painted pontoon bridge. The whole way here had been nothing but dry branches and shriveled leaves, 
but this place was verdant and vibrant, with tall stalks of bamboo that stood proud and unyielding, come wind or snow. The waters at Rufang sect had all been infused with spiritual power to prevent freezing, and so the ambience at the foot of the bridge was the sweet tinkling of running water, embraced by twin groves of lush green. When Moran turned around, he saw Ye Wangxi with his eyes downcast, gaze fixed on the sparkling stream, reflected light dancing across dark eyes. He was still the same person, but the weariness on his face was hard to miss. Nan Gung Su's marriage was really much too cruel to him. He, could, he suddenly found it hard to bear, as if he was looking at Chua Ning, who gave so much yet couldn't even get so much as a backwards glance. Moran asked, Ye Gung Su, why don't you come to Sisheng Peak instead? <gasps> yes, Moran, invite... <laughs> Invite Ye Wangxi to come back with you to Sishong Peak. Forget Ru Feng Sect. They have a terrible sect leader who would turn tail and run and abandon all of his own disciples. Um, we have this no good dog uh, sect leader's son who's getting married to Song Chu Tong despite um, having no interest in love and marriage. So what else with that? Um, the only person here at Ru Feng Sect that Ye Wangxi would stay with would be his Yifu, um, Shuang Lin. But... You know, I'm pretty sure Shuang, does Shuang Lin really care to stay either? He's kind of mischievous. I don't think he would mind if Ye Wangxi were to leave. Take, well, yeah, Ye Wangxi, Ye Gongzi, bring your father with you and come back to Sishong Peak, okay? Forget about Ru Feng Sek. They ain't worth it. Okay, Moran asked, Ye Wangxi, why don't you come back to Sishong Peak instead? What? Dot, dot, dot. The words felt impudent as soon as they'd left his lips. And he well knew what Ye Wangxi's answer would be anyway. Moran sighed. Ugh, just an offhand remark. Don't mind me. No, Moran, why would you take it back right after offering? Dumb dog, why would you do that? Ye Wangxi smiled in response. He used to have a very handsome and good-looking smile, with seven parts gallantry and three parts elegance. It was still the same person and the same smile, but his cheeks were a bit sunken in now, and though the seven parts gallantry were still there, the, the three parts elegance had withered away, leaving behind only tw twin pools of sorrow. He tried to hide it, but the sorrow was too deep to be covered despite his best efforts. He joked with a smile, Is Mo Shang here to poach people for Sishong Peak? Haha, <laughs> sure am, though Ye Gongzi probably wouldn't bite, so just take it as a joke. Mm, my Yifu is still here, so I'm not leaving. What do you plan to do then? Dot dot dot. There was a flash of pain across Ye Wangxi's expression, and for once he didn't have an answer at the ready. What did he plan to do? He didn't know either. He felt like he was a moth to Nan Gulsa's flame, couldn't help being drawn to that flame even if it would only lead to his own ruin. <laughs> Poor Ye Wangxi, guys. Nan Gulsa is not worth it. But Nan Gulsa didn't want him. <sighs> but Nan Gulsa didn't want him. I'll just stay here at Rufong Sek doing the things I'm supposed to do. Ye Wangxi said with a small smile. Serve the sect leader, serve Yifu, and later, serve the young master. He paused, hands tightening into fists, the joints turning pale as jade. Moran was perturbed that Ye Wangxi could actually manage to say the rest of that sentence so calmly, that he could actually say those words at all. Serve the young mistress. Having said that, he dropped his gaze as if finally unable to bear it any longer. But it was only for a brief moment, and then he lifted his head back up, looking at Moran in that gentle, polite way of his, even managing to keep smiling as he stood there in the bitter, cool, in the bitter cold of winter, resilient as the bamboo around them. A sudden gust picked up, sending the fresh fallen snow scattering amongst the bamboo groves. In that moment, Moran decided, no, Nan Gung Su was not going to marry Song Chu Tong. <gasps> Are you gonna crash the wedding? Are you gonna show up and be like, I object? <laughs> please, please do that. Please, I support you. Okay. So to recap chapter 154, um, Moran doesn't stand up and doesn't show any respect to Nan Gung Liu because he does not respect him because in the past life, Nan Gung Liu had turned tail and ran and abandoned Ru Feng sect and let Ta Xian Jun pretty much destroy the entire sect. So Moran has no respect for the sect leader. Um, and uh, after they part ways to go into their own little like pavilions, he decides to go and check out Ye Wangxi to see if he's okay because the last time he saw him was when Ye Wangxi was begging Nan Gongsi to come back to Ru Feng sect. And he was worried that uh, Ye Wangxi had been kicked out um, 
So he went to go check and he bumped into Na, uh, to Ye Wang Shi's Yifu and Master. Um, and then he decides to have some words with uh, Ye Wang Shi. He's like, how are you doing? How are you? He even tells Ye Wang Shi that Sha Sini was actually Chu Ning. So that was a little funny little story that he told. But, um, and then he decided, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna go for it. Ye Wang Shi, Ye Gong Su, why don't you ditch Ru Feng Sect and come join Su Sheng Peak? And of course, Ye Wang Shi said that he cannot because his master and his Yifu is still here. Plus, he is drawn to Nan Gong Su and he cannot let him go. So it's a sad, unrequited love that Ye Wang Shi is going through right now. He even has to force himself to say, I will stay here, serve. The Rufeng sect leader serve the young master and uh, 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 serve the uh, the young mistress. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so um he had to he had to throw out those words as well. And then Moran's like, uh, the heck you will not. I will make sure that Nan Gongzi and Song Chu Tong do not get married. Not on my watch. Don't worry, not uh, don't worry, Ye Gongzi. You got me. I got your back. So let's see what Moran's gonna do. Is he gonna crash the wedding? Is he gonna show up and, and try to expose some things? I don't know, we'll see. Let's keep reading. Chapter 155. Shijun, are you shocked? The grand wedding ceremony of the young master of the Rufeng sect was fast approaching, but there was suddenly a rumor surfacing to the top, spreading among the guests of every major sect. Zhang Gongzi, I have recently learned of something that sounded absurd at first, but after much thought, it was most likely true. Do you want to hear it? What a coincidence. I also have a secret that concerns the Rufo sect. It is also a shocking rumor. Perhaps it is the same thing you wanted to share. The other quirked his brows meaningfully and replied, Does the secret non does the secret Zhang Gongzi hold concern a particular couple? Indeed. The two exchanged a look. One of them said in a low voice, Listen to mine first. I heard Ye Wang Shi of the Rufo sect and the other couldn't hold back anymore upon hearing this, completely ditching the proper manners of a gongzi and bursting out laughing as he slapped his thigh. His eyes beaming with gossip, he exclaimed excitedly, Yes, yes, yes! Haha, it killed me! That's the secret! Ye Wang Shi and Song Chu Tong of the Rufeng sector having an affair! What? What? <laughs> Who is spreading this rumor? Excuse moi What? Song Chu Tong and Ye Wang Shi? Ye Wang Shi, the Ye Gong Su who hates Song Chu Tong's guts? Him and her are having an affair? Really? Who, who is spreading this nonsense? This really is good news stays indoors and bad news travels for a thousand miles. I didn't realize even you, Lian Gong Su, who doesn't enjoy listening to meaningless gossip, knew this. But we'll have to keep our voices down if we want to discuss it. We are in Lin Yi. There are people of the Rufang sect everywhere, so be wary of eavesdroppers. It was hard to say whether there really were eavesdroppers, but three men make a tiger. Rumors can become truths with enough talk, and this news was gradually swelling, like cotton wool soaked in water. Even though no one had actually witnessed the affair with their own eyes, the contents of the rumor were nonetheless more and more plentiful, growing spicier the more it spread. Until finally, even the non-cultivating commoners in the small villages outside of Lin Yi had heard, and the field circulated with the talk. Go dan ge. Let me tell you a secret. Don't tell anyone, okay? What secret? Acting all serious. Tell me. You know how well I keep my mouth shut. It won't ever get out. Listen well, then. There's an earth-shattering scandal the Rufeng sect. That Song Chu Tong. You know her, right? The woman who's about to marry Nan Gong Su? She's such a tramp. Go dan ge. Did you know? She's gotten chummy with Ye Wang Shi behind her own fiancé's back. How's that possible? Well, why not? Didn't you know that back when Song Chu Tong was being auctioned at Xuan Yuan Pavilion, it was Ye Wang Shi who grew lecherous at her beauty and bought her for dual cultivation purposes? Li Go Dan was quite shocked. His mouth hung wide open until he finally stammered out, My, my heavens, such a thing. This villager Li Go Dan's worldview was completely turned upside down, and at night in bed when he was cuddling his wife chatting, he marveled, Chun Hua, you're still the best after all. The villager Zhao Chun Hua blinked, What's wrong, saying that so suddenly? See, even though you're a little ugly and a little short, you're hardworking and can bear many children, not like some women cheating on their husbands and going against the values of womanhood. Zhao Chunhun was somewhat irritated. 
Oh, Zhao Chun Hua was somehow somewhat irritated. How am I ugly? Just because my face is a little sallow? Then she got curious. Whose wife is being promiscuous? How come I didn't know? It's not anyone from the village. It's those bunch of lord cultivators who fly around on swords all day. Zhao Chun Hua was astonished. Who is it? The one who's about to marry the grand wedding. Li Godan said. Zhao Chun Hua subconsciously did not consider in Dan Gongzi's direction and blanked for a good while before it abruptly dawned on her. She, dolt she jolted off the bed. My heavens, what? There is such a thing? You're not just talking nonsense, are you? Why would I talk nonsense? Li Godan puffed out his chest to make his wife believe him more. He said with great conviction, a friend saw with his own eyes how Ye Wang Shi of Ru Feng Sect is having an affair with Song Shu Tong. Those two have already slept together behind Nan Gongzu's back. Yo! Uh, how scandalous! Who is who is spreading these terrible rumors? Um, you know, I don't trust Song Chu Tong, but it's really mean to spread rumors about her cheating because we don't really know if it's true or not. Also, Ye Wang Shi has nothing to do with this. Why would you drag him into this? Damn! You know, don't you hate when gossip, like, grows and un unfounded rumors spread and then it's like, you can't even control the, you can't even control it anymore, like, people just take it for truth without checking the facts? Heartlessness and romance had always been one of the fastest news to travel. Whether it be the poor or the rich, cultivators or not, everyone loved to use it as a topic of conversation. In the blink of an eye, the guests gathered at the Rufang sect all more or less learned about this scandal. By the time it reached Chua Ning's ears, the content of the story had already been lavishly embellished, and even the year, month, day of Ye Wang Shi and Song Chu Tong's date was described in detail. They even went so far as to say Song Chu Tong was marrying Nan Gong Si now because she was already carrying Ye Wang Shi's child, and the fickle lover that was Ye Wang Shi refused to recognize the mother and child at the cost of his own career. Just you all wait and see who that child looks like after it's born, Nan Gong Si or Ye Wang Shi. Chuaning knew Nan Gongzi's character, but was unfamiliar with Ye Wang Shi and Song Chu Tong, so he couldn't be sure whether the rumor was true or not. He felt rage, but while someone with his personality might be an expert at differentiating right from wrong, when it came to the transient affairs of romantic relationships, he was completely at a loss of what to do. One day, Nan Gongzi came to pay a visit, and Chuaning gave him a subtle talking to, but Nan Gongzi didn't seem to understand the implied meaning at all and continued to happily tell Chu Zhongshu all about the fun stories of his pet fei wolf, Nao Bai Jin. I was breeding him the other day and it went fairly smoothly. That female fei wolf should be giving birth next month. I wonder how many wolf pups she'll give birth to, Nan Gongzi said while smiling. If some are born handsome, I'll have my father send one to Sishong Pi. When Chu Anning heard this, he felt it was a good chance and said, Hmm, but I worry the wolf pup's blood won't be pure. Why wouldn't it be? Now Bai Jin and that female Fei Wolf are both cultivated from snow wolves. They're plenty pure. You are that you are that certain that female Fei Wolf was never bred with other demon wolves before? Now Nan Gongsa blinked. That's impossible. That female Fei Wolf was raised by the Bhutan estate, and there's only one of her in the entire kennel. She couldn't have bred even if she wanted to. Our Now Bai Jin was all she had. Chu Anning felt his hint was already incredible. Chua Ning felt his hint was already incredibly obvious and very clear. He compared people to wolves to hint at all those rumors. So why couldn't Nan Gung Si understand? Did Nan Gung Si not even hear about the rumors? I mean, it's spreading so much that people like stop him from hearing it? Or does he really just not care? Chua Ning pondered and thought perhaps he wasn't precise enough. After some contemplation, he added, While well, she was the only fey wolf at the Bhutan estate, Bhutan estate she still had to stay at the Rufang sect for a while when you brought her over to brew with Nao Bai Jin, correct? You have so many fey wolves, might she have? She won't, she won't! Nan Gong Si started to laugh brightly. Oh, so that's what Jung is worried about. That female fey wolf and Nao Bai Jin are kept in the same cage. There's no chance for any other fey wolves. Dot dot dot. On your dumb head be it! Nan Gong Si didn't notice Chua Ning's gloom in the slightest, and he rose to his feet in invitation. Zhongshu, the construction of the Shaoyue at Track Field wasn't complete when you first left, and now it's been expanded twice already. Let me bring you over for a visit and take a ride on Nao Bai Jin. No, Chiu Ning rejected. Nan Gongsa was visibly disappointed. Why not? I don't know how to ride anything else but horses, Chiu Ning replied. You're about to be a married man. Settle down some. Don't be using wolf pups all day or waste time at the track fields. Go spend time with Miss Song if you're able. People and animals are 
are the same. If you don't spend time with her, you'll grow distant from one another. That won't happen. Song Chu Tong treats me perfectly well, and she's very obedient too. Dot dot dot. Then, Zhong Shi, if you think I'm neglecting her, I'll just call her over to join us. I'm always telling her about you, so she must want to meet you as well. At those words, Chi Wanning thought that since he didn't know Song Chu Tong well, he wasn't sure how much truth the rumors contained, so it wouldn't be a bad thing to get to know the junior married couple to be better than before Nan Gongsu's wedding. Thus, he nodded and rose to his feet. Very well, then go find her, and I will wait for you at the Shao Yue track field. While Nan Gongsu was leaving, he ran into Moran, who was just returning, at the courtyard, at the courtyard door, and the two bowed in greeting at the spirit screen. As Moran entered the courtyard, he spotted Chuaning standing beneath the Osmanthus tree. Before him was a small stove of red clay spouting with streams of steam, with strings of steam, and upon the stone table were two cups of half-finished eight treasure tea. Shi Jun, Nan Gongsu came to see you? Hmm, he wants me to go to the Shao Yue track field to take a look at the Fei Wolf he raised. Chu Wanning said as he turned around to head back inside. This attire is inconvenient for riding. I will go change. Fei Wolves were ferocious creatures, and although Maran knew Chu Wanning was capable, he was still too worried to let the man go on his own. I'll go with Shu Jun! Chu Wanning stopped in his step at this and gave him a sidelong glance. Do you know how to ride wolves? Moran smiled, his bright eyes, his black eyes bright. Why wouldn't I? My horse riding skills are superb, so theoretically, never mind wolves, I know how to ride anything. Chu Wanning was just about to tease him when he suddenly felt good at riding anything, connotated some sort of wet, ambiguous affair. The scenes that had appeared in his dreams flashed before his eyes involuntarily, and his mind wandered to the positions that the two of them had taken, taken within the dream of the sweat pooled at Moran's firm abdomen and how he had lain powerlessly on the divan for the other man to ride as he pleased, almost as if he had become a plaything under Moran's body as the man drove on. Boom! Chuaning flushed bright red. He scolded under his breath. Shameless. Who knew if he was scolding Moran or himself, but he turned and slammed the door shut behind him, leaving the half-rolled curtain still swaying, like the drawn-out quivering heart of the one who had fled to hide inside the house. Shao Yue track field was a vast pasture. The world was frozen now, the grass and trees windswept with a thin layer of frost covering the field where green met yellow. The winter day hung inoffensively over the sky, though because of the dark overcast lighting, it appeared meagerly cold, and the sun's rays that spilled down were even more perfunctory in their work, showing no signs of life. Nonetheless, at the end of the horizon stood the dense, private hunting woods of the Rufeng sect, Evergreens luxuriant with bushes of pine needles, glowing a field of gold from the distant glowing a field of golden from the distance like the fluffy and soft baby feathers of fledglings. Nan Gongsu was standing by the wooden fence in the middle of conversation with Song Chu Tong when he suddenly noticed two men approaching, emerging from the thin fog. It was Chu Ning and Moran, and he was slightly taken aback at first before he chuckled. Huh, Mo Zhongshu, have you come along too because you don't trust leaving your Shijun with me? <laughs> no! Moran chuckled as well. I came in case Shijun runs into anything upsetting and lashes out at young Master Nangong because he has no one else to yell out. What a grievance that'd be for young Master Nangong, so I'm here specifically as a punching bag. Dot dot dot. Chuaning, let him, Chuaning sent him a narrow glare and said frigidly, I think you're here to set things on fire. <laughs> Song Chu Tong, who was standing behind Nangong, giggled softly when she heard the exchange. Lifting her curtain of eyelashes as soft as baby feathers, she gracefully stepped out from behind her fiancé, delicate and lovely in bearing, beautiful in coif and face. She gazed at Moran and Chuaning as she gently chuckled. I have long heard talk of the deep master-disciple bond between Chu Zhongshu and Mo Zhongshu, and from what I see today, it appears to be true. End of chapter, and no author's note this time. Okay, so to recap chapter 155... Um, to recap 155, there seems to be some rumors floating around Ru Feng sect and Lin Yi in general. And the rumor goes that Ye Wang Shi and Song Chu Tong are having an affair behind Nan Gong Su's back. How terrible! Why would you slander both of their names like that? Uh, I feel bad for the both of them, but especially Ye Wang Shi, because Ye Wang Shi is already feeling really, really sad, and now he has to be associated with his rival in love? <laughs> uh, Ye Wang Shi, Ye Gong Su. But yeah, the the um 
the rumors are spreading and they just keep spreading from word of mouth and it's just rapidly spreading like fire, like a wildfire. It's crazy. Um, now, I don't know if Song Chu Tong and Ye Wang Shi and Nan Gong Si know about this rumor, but when Nan Gong Si went to visit Chu Wan Ning, Chu Wan Ning tried to hint at it, like to ask, like, are the rumors true? Nan Gong Si has no idea what Chu Wan Ning is talking about, so I don't know, either he doesn't care or um, he didn't hear about it and it's being kept from him. Either way, he seems to be in pretty good standing with Song Chu Tong and still is planning to go through with the marriage, so I don't know what's up with him. I mean, Maybe he's just marrying her because he wants to take over the sect, like it's just like a political marriage and it's nothing to do with love or anything because he doesn't seem to be really enamored by her. Like he thinks that she's obedient and pretty, but he doesn't talk like he's in love with her. So maybe he's just marrying her... I don't know though, but aren't there a lot of female cultivators at Rufeng sect? So why Song Chu Tong and not someone else? Is it, be is it because he's marrying her because she's a bone beauty feast? A butterfly bone beauty feast and cultivating with her would improve his cultivation? Is that why? I mean, that's plausible, I guess. Huh. Hmm. Nan Gung -se. What up? Tell me what's going on. Why are you marrying her? Is it is it for the cultivation reasons, mayhaps? Are you not really in love with her? Um, have you talked to Ye Wang Shi ever since the last time we've seen you guys together? Um, but yeah, uh... Chua Ning is like, hmm, maybe I'll go meet with Song Chu Tong to learn more about her. I want to know if the rumors are true. So he goes to meet Nan Gong Su and Song Chu Tong um, at the track field so that he can uh, converse with them and also check out the were the Fey Wolves that Nan Gong Su is breeding. And Maran decides to tag along as well because he's worried that Chua Ning might fall off the wolf. <laughs> he's like, I'm here to make sure that Chua Ning does not get injured. Um, but in order to not embarrass Chua Ning, he's like, I'm here as a punching bag. Shijun, hit me with all you got. So yeah, um, we're, we're, in the next few chapters, we'll get to see the newlyweds interact, and we'll see if they really are in love, or it's something entirely different. Hmm. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed today's read-along, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye!